So I might just sort of stand up and, and uh, see how much play I've got on this mic. Is that okay? Yeah. Still hear me okay? Right. So we're, this morning, we're going to talk for an hour. Hopefully it's an interactive session. Hope we don't want to talk at you. We want to have a conversation um, about tech careers. We're all in the tech industry. We're all going to talk about that. And I'm Will Callahan, first name there. Uh, we're joined by Theo, by Ethan and by John. Um, I think the next slide is introductions from all of us. Uh, so I've been in the tech industry for about 25 years. I'm a product manager and delivery manager. My claim to fame is GovUK, so if you've ever been on that website and you know, uh, got a driving license or anything like that, I'm part of the team that launched that. Uh, John, do you want to go next? Yeah, cool. Hi, I'm uh, John Haynes. I'm a product designer. Um, and I work for a company called Entertainment Partners, and we do payroll for film and TV, which is both incredibly exciting and incredibly dull. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to talking about that. Um, hello, I'm Theo. I've been through um, tech results and student process, and now I work at a AI pharmaceutical company called Benevolent AI. Do you I'm Ethan. I work at a payments company called TrueLayer. Um, I've been working there for two years as a software engineer. Thank you. So, good panel. It's really it's a good opportunity to talk about what you would do, what we do, and how we do more, you know, as an industry. Uh, so, for the next hour, we'll give it, I'll just give you a little bit of a plug for tech resort where I work and the thing that we founded. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about tech sectors and jobs. I'll tell you what my experience of software teams are like, and maybe we can have a bit of a group chat about that. Um, how we work together, and this is a whistle stop tour, we hope it's about 20 minutes this first bit. And then we'll go through our speakers and we'll you know, talk a bit more freely about what we'll be doing. Um, hopefully lots of time for questions, but as I said earlier, if you've got a question, you don't need to put your hand up, just shout. And that's alright, isn't it? We'll, just, we'll, we'll do our best to answer you and we'll get a bit more of a chat going. Um, also, I mean, I've probably said this a few times now, what would you like to know about? We don't know about you, we don't know whether you're students, you're policy makers, you know, you work in the industry yourself. So have a think about what you want to know, because it's okay for us to put half of these slides in the bin, that's absolutely fine. And not do a can talk to you, we can just talk. Um, so let us know. If you feel like this isn't working for you, don't be, just say, look, can we talk about this instead? You know, we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. So, very briefly, Tech Resort. Uh, we just, uh, we're in Eastbourne, not for profit. We just celebrated our 10th birthday. Some of the folks on the panel have been through Tech Resort. We basically do digital skills, digital property work. You won't want to come see us. We've got our office right by the pier. It's about two minutes walk from the pier. We do 3D printing and laser cutting and making. We go into schools, we do clone clones, we want to do more of that actually. We recycle laptops and help people with digital quality. We help people get online, there's a lot of folks that left behind. Uh, we also don't get any cool funding, so if you've got deep pockets, uh, go to our website and give us a donation because it's all been done on donations. Um, we also run a site actually called Digital Inclusion Toolkit, uh, which is a nationwide resource to help everybody, help councils primarily with digital inclusion issues. That's us. Let's talk about the tech sector. And please chip in. So there are lots, the tech sector is lots of different mini sectors, I guess. Um, everything from game development, <coughs> excuse me, to you know help desks, web design and development, QA, system as a network. The bit I work in is software engineering. I'm not a software engineer, I'm not an engineer. I'm a product manager, but I'm part of a software engineer team. I think John, yours might not be on here, but we can talk about that. And I think Theo and Ethan, you're in software engineering and AI. I don't know if that's on here. Do we do this slide? Um, I don't know if you read the newspapers, there's not enough of us at all. Um, and, and it's a problem. It's, it's a problem because 
we could grow, we could grow our economy, we could do more for GB, PLC. And I think also we, we could be more diverse. The teams I've been in are very diverse, but we want more women in the industry, we want more BM, BA and E in the industry, because it makes better products, makes better products and services. So please, please think about this as a career. The other nice thing to think about is that it's quite well paid. Um, hopefully we will be reasonably well paid. Uh, so if you're a junior developer, I mean, here's some job ads I picked up the other day, you, know, you could start 35 grand. You know, that's not bad for a starting job. I mean, money's not the only motivator, but this helps, right? Um, product manager, what I do, you know, pretty good senior, junior to senior, midway to senior salaries, content design, user research. There's a lot of jobs out there. And these roles aren't getting filled. So, you know, right now, it's a good opportunity to get in. And I think we can talk about this. I think a lot of this is AI proof, but we can talk about that. You know, they're creative jobs. It's quite hard to automate this in a way. You know, AI will supplement what we do, but it won't. I don't think replace what we do. Let's have a chat about that. Um, <laughs> maybe, well, maybe, in theory. Okay. I don't think it'll replace what I do. It won't replace what I do. Um, so let's talk about what software teams are actually like. So this is a team that I was in. Um, it's in Croydon Council. I've got a question for you. Who are the bosses? The women. Yeah. Um, you call them, call them out. Who? The two at the front. Uh, right in the middle. I would say the guy with the hoodie. Guy with the hoodie. And perhaps the woman in the left side. So the very, very big boss uh, is the guy with the hoodie. Uh, his name's Neil Williams, he's the chief digital officer. But who are the others? The woman on the end, short hair? Uh, the woman on the far end, far right, she's the deputy. And uh, the one in the middle with uh, the sort of, the, uh, sort of uh, the lanyard and the sort of, uh, what is that, like a beige dress? Yeah. Product manager, so she's senior. And who else? The guy on this on the left, Tom, I work with him, he was my boss, he was senior. But it's, it's diverse, and this is one of the most diverse teams I've worked in. And they're not all like this. But, you know, we don't wear jackets and ties, whatever your teachers might say. You know, it's not, there's not a uniform in the tech industry, it's quite affordable. Um, they, they are really nice places to work if you get a good team. I mean, I don't know what your experiences would be like, but they are really nice and diverse, fun places to work. Um, I might change this to lionesses because this is an odd slide. But, um, we are the teams I've been in. We are genuine teams. So we work. We work in teams. We are self-contained autonomous things where we have all the skills we need. You know, coders, designers, researchers, writers. We are. We are in charge of our own destiny. And that's, the, that's the best way to be. And, and what we're doing is we're trying to learn by doing. So I, I think a lot of people. Say, oh, I know everything. I've, the number of meetings I go into and people say, oh, I know, I know the answer to this. I'm absolutely certain of this. What I do in my job, product management, is I try and embrace uncertainty. You know, I don't know, but I know how to find out. But we learn by experimentation and testing, which I'll talk about. Right? And the more of that you put in, the better, the better outcomes you can get. So if you sit on the sidelines, it doesn't work. If you're active, you're involved. It does. Here's the thing that I've worked in. It's just useful.
And then we actually have to build. Mark, Eek, Maria, and some other developers I work with, is generally not grumpy. Uh, we build. And you know, developers are all lots of different kinds of people. They specialise in different languages. These three are all Drupal developers. Drupal is a content management system, but it could be anything. Um, there will probably be some specialisms in the room. AI, Rust. I'm not sure, but we, we, with other bits we can talk about that. But you can specialise in particular areas and, and, and do that work. And then we need to look good and we need to be understandable. So interaction design, content design, they are tech disciplines. They're creative tech disciplines. And the number of students I talk to who don't know this, they don't know that these jobs actually exist, and they do. Yeah? But how would they? Well, that's a good question. We should be better at telling them. How yeah. would students actually have that interaction? Yeah, exactly. We need to do better. Um, English graduates, the number of English graduates I know that work in content design or history, or, you know, humanities graduates. I'm a humanities graduate, but did architecture. So, and then delivery managers, somebody, you know, somebody who's a conductor or somebody to keep the rhythm that keeps together. His name is Finn, he's a brilliant delivery manager. He makes sure that we work well, sustainably, that we're happy. You know, this is not a, you know, it's not flogging us to get the work done, it's about morale, the tempo, doing good work. So, I'm a strategist, I guess. I'm a strategist, we can't say the word. Researching, analysing, coding, designing, writing, delivery. That's what we do. That's a team that does those things together. And, you know, you'll see this more. You know, if you go into the industry, you'll see this. You won't necessarily have an individual job for all of these, but that's the stuff that we do, right? Yeah. Um, you can find out more about this relating to the software industry. There's probably better links than this, but if you type, if you type this horrible phrase, DDAP framework, into Google, the first thing you get is a page that's called the Digital Data Technology Profession. It's a public sector, government name, I didn't name it. But it will tell you about these jobs. Um, it can be a bit wordy. If you've got any questions, just drop the tech resort in email and we'll help you out, because it can be uh, just a bit of a brief. And that's me. That's what I do. Uh, do you, if you're wanting to get into the industry, do you have these skills? And if you're trying to get, if you're trying to hire, do you need to recruit these skills? Do you have them in your company right now? Do you want to do these jobs? Have a think about that. We can talk about that as a group. Um, I'm nearly done. So I wanted to talk to you about sort of two concepts that are very important to me and the work that I think a lot of people in the tech industry do. The first one is a word, it's agile. Has anyone heard of that? Yeah, as opposed to waterfall. Yeah. Um, so, so waterfall is a project management technique that's been around for years, and it's been shunned by a lot of places and people moving around for away from that. So it's basically saying we know everything, we, or we don't. We'll get in the room, we'll write down all the things that we want to build, we'll go and build them, and then we'll shift the thing. And great, happy users. It's never going to work. We, don't, we haven't talked talk to anybody about what they want. We haven't shown them anything. We haven't measured anything. And a lot of the big failures you read about in IT are basically down to this. So Agile is, a, is a, an antidote to that. There's something called the Agile Manifesto. I won't show you, but you can Google that. So basically it's saying we don't really know. Well, here are some things that we certainly know. We can maybe do all those things. Here are some things that we're not. So we will try and work out what we're trying to find out. We might build some prototypes. We might measure them. Learn something or know more, we can go again in a big circle like this. And that's how the best software I think is built. So that build, measure, the iterative loop is the thing. And I bet you don't do it in college, and you should, because that's how you know the world the world works, how the software world works. So try and do that if you can. The other thing is MVP. Does anyone know what that stands for? I know you do. <laughs> Who else? Uh, I know you do. Anyone else? <laughs> go on, go on. <laughs> Minimum viable product. Minimum viable product. Does anyone know what MDP stands for? Minimum desirable product. Anyway, does anyone know what MDF stands for? <laughs> um, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> so it's basically saying um, we are we're not going to build when we're building a bit of software. 
we could do the thing like the thing on the top. We could say, we need a car that's amazing, we'll build it wheel, we'll build it brilliantly, and then we'll build some axles, and then we'll build the body, and then we'll build the whole thing. So we'll make the best version of each thing, and we'll bolt them together. But you can see, you know, the wheel on its own doesn't work. You need to get part of things. So what, basically, the minimum trial of product is, what's the least thing that we need to get going to move somebody, in this case? So we'll build a skateboard, and then we'll build a scooter, and you can see how Agile and this concept work together. So I'm given a software problem. I'll fix it with a skateboard. I won't fix it with a Rolls Royce. I won't fix it with the best possible thing I can make because it'll cost too much money. So I'll make something small to understand. And I'll make something a bit better when I understand some more, and so on and so on. And ultimately, you'll get what you want. So threads is a really good example. So who's on threads? So when it launched, people go, this is not finished. It's not finished. But the product managers who ran that, the teams that ran that, said, this is good enough, this is good enough. It might not have everything, but we're trying to find out what people want. We could just rebuild Twitter, that's not what this is about. We're trying to find out what people want, and we'll add and add and add to it. So features will, will appear over time, and we'll be able to better people. You might be frustrated for now, but if you understand what's going on, overall it's a better process. We could talk about that. So let's recap. So we're a team. We've got all the skills that we need. We show you about some of those, talk about some of those. And we learn by doing. We, we don't act like we know everything at the start, because we really don't. We don't pretend to. And if we put out, put in a bit of effort, we'll understand problems better. If we really talk to our users and understand our data, we'll do a better job. We feel all the time. Let's move on. Yeah. Oh, before we. So, as I said already, I'm Theo. I'm currently um, a software engineer at AI at the bottom there. Um, we're a company that um, makes AI systems to help scientists develop drugs, develop medicines. Um, what I wanted to do in this section was give you like the history of my life, how I got here. Um, it's been like a slightly unusual journey, I think, and there might be some unusual bits that are interesting for you to hear. Um, so it all kind of started when I was at secondary school in, in Cavendish. Um, and my IT lessons were so, so, so boring. Huh. Right, I did, I think I did, um, like the whole course worth, worth of work in about four weeks and my teachers were fed up with me. Um, I had one, one excellent teacher who then put me into another class and I did that and then again and I did that and she didn't know what else to do with me. And she found this award that was called the Crest Award. Um, it's like a, an award that you achieve if you do a fairly sizable project in any STEM area. Um, that wasn't something that the school could support at all, so she put me in touch with Will as a mentor. Um, through tech was on. And we came up with an idea um, to help tourists in Eastbourne 
understand better what was going on in the town. We saw a gap um, between event organisers and the tourists, and it was difficult for um, yeah, the organisers to actually get tourists to go into their events. Um, we noticed that there were there were tons of screens in all of the hotels, TV screens in hotels that were used like once a week. There might have been a, a, a sports game put for the sports game on the TV, um, and we decided that it would be it would be kind of cool if event organisers could have a platform where they could put details of their events, and those events would get put right in tourists' faces already. They didn't even have to try and look for the details; they would be right there. Um, I'm going to show you, I'm kind of sad the screen is so huge, this next slide is just all really old photos of me, <laughs> so we're not going to look. <laughs> this, is the, this is the process of us developing um, what eventually became called the now screen. Um, you can see in a few places there's TVs behind us and there's events on, on those TVs. Um, it was a really tricky project. I didn't have a clue what I was doing at the start. I didn't have a clue how to do any of the things that we were doing. Um, and I was really in the deep end. Like there were, there were tons and tons of people who were, who were helping me out. Um, but it was a lot of trial and error. Um, a lot of spending time on my laptop, pressing buttons, and waiting for something to work. Um, but we, we got there and we, we built something cool. And, um, by the end of the project, by the time that it was, I'd done enough to win this award, we had this um, this system live in, it, like, I think, about five or six hotels. Um, we had a, a platform where event organisers could write their details. They would go to the, the hotel screens without anyone having to having to do anything, actually. And so I got this press award. Um, but we both thought that the idea was actually quite a good one. We didn't want to just make it an award thing and stop it there. Um, we teamed up with um, Rob and Adam. Rob's a, Rob's a software engineer. Um, Adam is a, a, a content designer. And we kept going with the idea. And we turned it into, into a, a company that we later called Now Screen. Um, it became less specifically about tourism, it's very generally like a, a digital signage company. Um, we ended up with, I think, about um, around 100 screens. We, we didn't just focus on tourism, we had clients in like education and um, retail. Um, and yeah, it was, a, it was a fun journey. There's some um, examples of what it became. Um, what was, you know, not just events at the end, um, but it was fun. Well. I skipped slide way too quickly, but it's fine. Um, <laughs> and again, would you like a back one? Perfect. Um, so that was an answer. It was a, a, a really, really good learning opportunity for me. Um, I learned, I think, like the most I have done in my life so far in that in that project. Um, you look and much more chill now, mate, I must say. Thank you. Yeah, it was... We did scout. It was through school and college, I think. Um, most of it was college, it was late, yeah. late school time. Yeah, you got both. East Sussex, yeah. East Sussex Colleges, I was at um, Park, Park College. Was, was there. Um, but yeah, I think the, the majority of it was while I was at college. It started while I was at school. And what course did you do at college? At college, I did um, computing and maths and physics, like, as, as I'm sure you would guess. Um, and then, yeah, after college, I went to um, university. I went to Warwick University and did computer science. And we carried on with now screen for most of the time I was at uni. Um, it sort of slowly, slowly fizzled out um, during that time. 
um, purely because we were all really, really busy, we didn't have the, the time to the time to dedicate to it. Um, but no, it was a, it was a great time. Um, it was really good. Um, so yeah, university, I went to Warwick University and did computer science and learned a lot at university, like there's there's no there's no way around it, but I think it's fair to say that I learned a lot more from doing than at university. Um, so would an apprentice, sorry, if you're talking about no, no, it's, would an apprenticeship quite say how long an apprenticeship has been best for you? I think so. I I certainly could do what I was <clears throat> what I do now in my job, I could certainly do without having gone to university. I think the problem at the time, and this is sort of five years ago, me getting my first job, would have been getting a job without a degree. Mm. If that makes sense? Yeah. So as a, as a piece of paper that I ended up with, great, it got me a good job. I don't think I would be where I am now without it. But I definitely learned more by doing it. Yeah. Like kind of job um, with with this. Yeah, it did have to really part of how you were able to get around from the to crow to pay. So that's Yeah, so just in terms of payment, um, later on in the project it was paid for, we got grant funding, and it was paid for, so. And there are opportunities out there, you know, you can, if you've got innovative software, you can go for grant funding and fund teams, you know, we've done it for other things in terms of. Personally, every time I've employed someone, always go experience first and then or equivalent qualification. So I would always look for people that have experience doing the thing. And if you've got a qualification, that can be counted as experience. Um, but from my experience in, in, in the sort of side of this that I do, which is about to change, um, which we can get into, um, I would be looking for people that can evidence that they've done, you know, they've got kind of design thinking skills and that they've got some experience trying to, because there's a lot of frameworks and things that people learn in university that until you actually apply, um, you don't realise kind of how to really use it. Um, so I, would, I personally prefer, but that also is based on my own personal experience. I don't know about you. So I'm a, I'm a one-man band on my own, I employ for other people, some of my clients, and I would say they see a degree is irrelevant, yeah. <laughs> really. Um, and I'm, that's public sector, so I don't, I don't remember the last time where we looked at people's, I'm not saying don't get your A-levels, do you get your A-levels, yeah. do you get your degree, uh, if, that, if that's the way you want to go. But actually, I think the reason you did so well for you, and I won't speak for you, for you and say, say this for yourself, is you might have those qualifications, but actually you can turn it to an interview and uh, talk about a project that you've actually started and been part of on your own. There's no, there's no substitute for saying, I love, now screen in this case, I love whatever, I'm interested in these things. I can talk about who it's for, what it does, where we're going next, what we think the problems with our product are, the problems with the product. And that's more interesting. That was in your first set of interviews, because you took me telling me about it. Yeah, I, I've never been asked anything about my degree in your job interview. I've always been asked about that screen. It's just much more um, important for an employer to see, and, and, and from the other side as well, being a, um, in, interviewing people. I think I think the problem is hiring someone who has no experience. Right? You you need something as an employer to, to show you that this person um, will be able to do what, what 
what you need them to do in a degree. Is that a thing in a lot of cases? As soon as someone has had their first job, couldn't care less. <laughs> I was mostly going to second that. Uh, I, I joined uh, my first job, which is a job I'm at now, without a degree. Uh, and uh, it is difficult to, to get in without, uh, without a degree and uh, then proving that you have experience and understanding to, to get the job. But definitely when I'm interviewing people, uh, you, you don't look at the degree once they've got a single piece of experience. It doesn't, it's not worth anything anymore once you've got your foot in the door. Um, it's just about getting your foot in the door. Um, yeah. I will on that point if I can. I mean, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I will bring just a point, just because we have this question, I guess. So, I'm a project designer, but I'm from Brazil and I immigrated to the UK, right? So, all you guys are saying about my experience, I felt the other way around. Just because I'm from Brazil and nobody knows the companies I work for, so I studied in NYU in New York. So it's the first thing that they asked me. It's like, oh, have you went to NYU or um, like US? And I also studied at the European University. So I was like, don't know anything I've ever been or my university or any other degrees that I had. The first thing they ask is about university. But I'm a foreigner, so if you are from outside the UK, I guess it's very interesting. I think like that's your interview is bad really like they should do some research on the companies that you've worked at it doesn't matter if they're not UK companies yeah um, it's kind of disappointing to hear you just need to pick up the internet <laughs> <laughs> I mean NYU is a, a fairly prestigious university maybe maybe that's why um, why people want to talk to you about it. Um, but I'm surprised that they yeah, didn't ask about your yeah, experience. I went to a quite big university in Brazil, right? So, cute. So they never asked me that. But it's usually the first thing they ask. Even, I'm, I, I'm a product designer for seven years now, so it's not like I don't have any experience. Um, I've done a lot of interviews here in the UK, and they only started stopping me at Now that I have worked in that UK company for a year, then they stop. Well, when I first, my first round was like every time, it's like, oh yeah, we don't know this whatever company you work in Brazil, which is also big, but they were like, oh yeah, you went to the European University, blah, blah, blah. I'm finding myself wanting to ask you about going to uni in New York and Brazil and <laughs> Europe. <laughs> <laughs>
The actual work that they do in, in their jobs that they've landed, unfortunately. Um, but these are the, the teams that we've worked in. My first job is a tiny, tiny company. There's four of us when they joined. Um, it's called Unlikely AI. Um, and we worked on some like unconventional AI systems. The, the, the focus was on making explainable AI that some people could trust rather than um, statistical like black box. <coughs> And this is my current company, Benevolent AI. This is the place that we spend most of our time. Um, <laughs> the pub, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and um, yeah, as I said, so well, we um, make AI systems to, to help in the, the development of medicines. Um, but yeah, that's my CV in word form. Um, I will pass over to. You think you've done it? Yeah, so you, um, you, you, <laughs> you, you already know my name's Ethan, I work at, at True Lab. Um, I thought I'd share a bit about my experience. Um, so yeah, I've been working at TrueLair for two years. Um, we built payment systems, as I mentioned. Um, and it was my, my first job, uh, my first full-time job. Um, so it was a lot of, lot of learning uh, when I joined. Um, Again, the idea of planning and uh, building services and all, the whole payment space. Um, like back then, I didn't even know that product managers existed. I was really surprised to see product managers. Um, I mean, Will's talk would have been helpful for me back then if I had it. Um, yeah, so um, at, in payments, there's sort of two main challenges um, either potency and consensus, uh, where consensus is about making two machines agree on where money is. and Item potency is about uh, ensuring that no transfer is, is counted twice for the sake. Um, I've lived in a digital sport my whole life. I started programming when I was around 10. Um, later on after that, I discovered Tech Resort. I was involved with Tech Resort uh, apparently at the same time as Theo, but I never really met him. <laughs> um, and Tech Resort was really my, my first taste of community um, and learning from peers uh, and really being encouraged to, to develop further. When I was um, studying A-levels, I started getting involved with more communities, um, mostly out of London and Brighton. Um, and there I developed skills around like, talking with other technical people um, and I met people that later became mentors, um, like uh, Dave here, um, who's mentored me for, for a number of years. 
Um, and I also met at one of those events the person that later referred me to the, the job I have now. Um, so I, I really credit events and connecting with people um, for my ability to get into a job without a degree. Um, I think that events are a great way of managing your unknowns um, and getting to see a little bit of what things are like in the real working world. Um, Chalky Sports School has been doing great things for like with this conference and with other um, other events that they're doing. Um, I didn't have that when I was starting out. Yeah, so that's all for me. Slides. I won't keep it right now. I've got like a very large at the end of the <laughs> presentation. I think probably lunch or I think coffee at least. Um, my name's John. I'm a product designer. I've done product design for roughly eight years. Um, also, Cavendish alumni, not tech resort alumni. Don't think it existed when I was there because um, I'm not one of the youngsters. Thanks for that. Um, <laughs> it's all right. I see myself in the mirror. It's fine. We'll get into that in the pictures. You'll see. You'll see. You'll see. Um, uh, I kind of agree with everything um, uh, that, that's been said. I, I think like networking, mentoring, finding a community is is great. To pick up on your point earlier, like I had no idea what I wanted to do. I still don't really know what I want to do. I don't know what I want to be. Um, but what I've done is focus on the core set of skills and then um, taken them with me and transferred them. So I studied film and television production at the university. Which is why I don't believe university degrees matter because no one. Um, but what did matter as part of that, the reason I did that degree was because I went to go and get, there was two things that I needed to go and work in film and TV, and that was experience and equipment, and I had neither of those things. Um, so I went to university to go and study that. So, oh, I've gone too far, I've done the reveal. Can anybody take me back a slide? <laughs> Scroll back. No, no, maybe, maybe, there we go. There he is, there's the youngster, right? You might notice the, the change. Um, I wanted to be an editor, um, and then I started editing. I realised I didn't want to be an editor, um, because all that was coming into my edit suite was somebody else's story, um, and quite often the shots that I was being given as the editor um, weren't how I'd tell the story. So I left the edit suite, and started to work as a uh, cameraman, sort of producer director role, which basically just means you can do all of it, um, and they only have to pay one person, and they still get a film made at the end of the day. Um, so that's what that guy was doing about ten years ago, and then now this is the most designer picture I think I've ever, I could possibly have. Um, very aware of this, this is not. Uh, it's not that serious. Yeah, yeah, it's very proper. <laughs> But the answer is that's an old band. Um, <laughs> but essentially, all I've done is taken the same storytelling skills out of sort of film and TV and transferred everything that you need as part of that to work in the digital sort of tech sector. So my job as a product designer um, involves it's kind of a blend of a, a number of the skills that, that um, Will was uh, that had different people. Um, let me start that again. <laughs> Product design is a range of different skills that you might find employed as one individual. So coming back to that predator role of producer, director, editor with a cameraman, product designer is a bit of a jack of all trades, right? It's a bit of a generalist skill. And then you're doing research, you're interpreting that research, you might be doing some data analysis, 
you interpret that data analysis, what you're trying to do is figure out what people want, and then you're trying to figure out the fastest way of getting to that thing. Um, and quite often, I work very closely with product managers, I work very closely with uh, engineers to basically make that thing happen. Um, and the three things that I think are like tenets of all of these jobs, all of the roles that you've seen out today, is usually there's some component of storytelling. Right, you can't work in a team without really good storytelling. Um, and working with like senior stakeholders and working with other other teams, like being able to tell the story. Um, and we use very specific formats for that in the, in the tech sector. Being really good at being able to break something down um, and effectively tell a story very quickly. Um, understanding how to work out value, right? Understanding how to quantify value is incredibly important in, in design, but in, in all of these things, um, because uh, uh, what you want to be able to do is prioritize one feature over another, or like how do you know that the minimum viable product is done, but you need to understand what the value it is that it is trying to deliver, and you need to know how to measure that value. Um, so storytelling, the value, um, and then working on other ways to collaborate. Right, so it's, it's the, the kind of collaboration is key, even though I'm a generalist, I can kind of do a bit of all sorts, and I'm actually probably about to change my career and, and get out of product design and move into data. Um, all of those same skills are the same. It doesn't matter if I'm designing a dashboard for an internal team to measure their success, or whether I'm designing a big, complicated new payroll product for the film and TV, you know, it's going to change the film and TV industry. The, the key skills that I'm using across those things are the same. Um, my career basically went cameraman to doing online content for celebrities, to running their websites, to helping to design their websites, to working at a couple of startups doing, first one was travel guides, which never goes well, um, and the second one was like hardware, which also never goes well. Um, and then I kind of landed in the business that I'm in now, which has kind of come from circle where I'm working with the film and TV industry uh, doing product design. Um, so when I say what's next, the reason I want to talk about sort of transferable skills, and this is where we can get on to kind of talk about like properly what's next, because we've got some people that are working in AI, which is very exciting, and it's a very big kind of, it's a very small buzzword, but um, uh, it's a big, you know, kind of hot topic. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do, I still don't know what I wanted to do. I've got a set of more transferable skills. For me, product design, if you look at what ChatGPT can do today, right, what like kind of GPT technology can kind of do, where it can construct glib arguments based on a small prompt, you can imagine that if a computer knows what a user wants to do, it could design the user interface, right? It wouldn't take long. You give it a core set of components and go, this user's trying to complete a form, and it goes, ah, I know, how to, I know what a form is. Put all that together, that's my job. Don't need that anymore, right? I don't, I don't think that's gonna be here in two years. From a design perspective, I think the thing that's important is about understanding the intersection of what the user needs, not necessarily what they want, it's not always the same, in fact, it's rarely the same. What the business needs in order to be successful, the business that you're in, or the business that you founded, or, and sort of sit in between the cross-section of those two and understanding how they relate. Um, and so for me, I'm going to be moving into kind of a more data-focused role where I'm going to be trying to put all of this together and help the teams that I work with, the product teams that I work with, interpret all of this stuff. But, yeah, I wondered whether we could maybe spend five minutes on where we think all of this is going because I definitely would have appreciated someone when I was uh, just leaving school, kind of as you mentioned, to just kind of say, yeah, you don't really need to know exactly what you want to do, but there is a whole sector out there where you can basically apply if you've got this kind of curiosity um, and a want to kind of make an impact and an understanding of how to quantify outcomes. Um, you can have a fun career, but it's great. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know, what do you think about the kind of the futures of your roles? I think when it comes to engineering, it might be a bit more predictable. But. Yeah, I definitely don't think it's, things are going to go away. Things are definitely going to change. I definitely see my, my colleagues using GitHub 
Copilot. Um, I'm kind of scared of it. I don't want to. Does everyone know what that is? Uh, no. Okay. Does everyone know what ChatGPT is? Yeah. Okay. It's kind of like that, but for code. So it's a, it's a transformer technology that GitHub. You start typing something, and it's a, it's a bit like for anyone that isn't a young one. Do you remember Clippy? Right? When you used to start typing a letter, and it would say, it looks like you're typing a letter. And then you could press a button, and it would just format the Word document into a letter. It's a bit like that, right? Exactly like that. How far it's come, that's wild. Aww. Yeah. We loved yeah. him. Clippy was just an MVP for GitHub Copilot, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, there's this, uh, this comic, this XKCD comic um, that I like, uh, that says, with AI we'll be able to write a sufficiently good specification that will allow us to generate a program without needing a programmer. And then uh, the other person in the comic uh, responds with, that specification is called a program. Um, so we're always going to need someone that can communicate to the computer what the customer needs, what the program needs to do, and that's going to evolve, and it's always evolved. Um, so I, I guess we just need to keep up with the changes, and we'll be fine with, with, with at least software engineering jobs. No. Um, so, so we get a lot in, in the public sector, in local government, and the NHS, we get lots of pitches from Microsoft, they're desperate to sell us something called Code Pilot which is that sort of AI suite. And it's very cheap to get started, and then as you add users, the costs run massively. And I think, you know, it's gonna bankrupt people. Mm. It's, it's superficial and cool mm. as a piece of software. So I don't think we've got any issues anytime soon. Mm. I think particularly as well, a lot of software experiences are so bad at the moment. You know, people outside of Google UK try and do anything else. You know, there's a lot of poor software out there that's not doing a good job. I think we've got quite a lot of work to do as an industry. Mm -hmm. I think the challenge will be is if managers say, oh, I think this board AI can actually replace people like me. If that happens, we have got a problem. But I think it will be, I think there'll be a realisation you can't do yet what we're actually doing. I hope mm -hmm. that will be the case. Certainly with the people I work for, you know, AI has been tried. Robotic process automation, or, you know, which would be has been tried and it's not really a substitute for good design, good experiences, mm. you know, interactions with the content design. So I, I'm hopeful. But you know, Microsoft's hard at this, they want to follow the thing. So. Yeah. I'm, I, I've got to say, I, I'm definitely optimistic about, um, about the future of this stuff. I do think that, uh, like I say, it's kind of, you said like, the, the prompt to your computer that's going to build the thing is the program. Um, and like the one thing that I would want to communicate to anybody that's listening that's interested in getting involved or interested to progress is think about the things that can transfer, don't get bogged down in tools, don't get bogged down in particular languages and things because all of that changes. It's a lovely thing that the CTO of my business has talked about a couple of times, is that everything becomes technical debt eventually. Yeah. Right? Like not all of your code lives forever, right? Unless you're, um, who's the author, who's got that? What's it called? It's bouncing between guns and bullets. Terry yeah, I think Terry Pratchett's living forever in code, but other than that, I don't think it, <laughs> that's going to require some people. But um, that idea of like transferable skills, that's why I was saying about sort of telling stories. If you're able to tell the computer what, you know, if you're able to become a prompt engineer and tell the computer what to do to get an effective outcome, like that's, that's kind of, that's, that's where I was heading. Yeah, yeah I think. This large language model from um, the, the Google large language models is um, kind of problematic in a lot of ways. Like the, there was a lot of hype around it, and um, a lot of companies shifted very quickly to doing very new things that haven't really come to fruition. These are models that are like good at doing a lot of things, but they're not great at doing anything. Um, and that's good for a lot of new companies. You can you can really quickly now get to a, a really impressive MVP. It's like an entirely new way of interacting with a computer 
have this like very natural conversation, conversation in space. Like, I don't want to say any of the words in case anyone has one of them, but the voice assistants we currently have a trash, right? None of them do what you want them to do. ChatGPT, you can have like fairly real conversations with it. And I think it's a technology to, to change the interface between between humans and computers is going to be cool. But I don't think it's like a we're going to take a wrong jobs of any kind of technology at all. If I was the arbiter of this, which I'm definitely not, <laughs> please don't take any of this as advice. Um, but my advice would be <laughs> um, to try and take it back to first principles. I, I, I don't think you can. I don't think you can properly properly understand something unless you understand the component parts that you're working with. And I think in product design, the component parts that we're working with are people's needs. They're the things that they don't often communicate. They do communicate, but implicitly. They talk to you about all of this other stuff, but actually what they need is very different. I do timesheets for film and TV. No one gets into film and TV to fill out a timesheet. Right? Very, very few people that fill out timesheets um, do it because they want to complete the timesheet. They want to get paid. Right? And that's the motivation. And so for me, working out and trying to get back to kind of first principles on this stuff is, is uh, uh, the, the kind of fundamental thing that I need as a, as a skill. And I think when it comes to working with, I don't think every developer, every um, uh, uh, software engineer needs to be able to get down to binary, right? But I think the ones that understand it at a binary level probably have a deeper understanding of the technology and they can make better, more informed choices about the technology and the mediums that they're deploying um, to get something done. Right, so um, you know you can you can make efficiency savings in a business by understanding to switch from one thing to another. But when he's programming in Rust, right at the moment he's using Rust probably because that's what his employer uses. It's not necessarily because he's chosen that tool. I don't know. I'm making a big assumption there, but ah. set, but you went into, you went into using Rust, which is a code, code language. It's like a um, and so you know, but like. As you continue your career, you will get into positions where people are asking, "Well, what should we use for this?" You know, and having an understanding, background understanding, even if it was ten years old, right? You'll be able to apply the kind of principles of that to help make those decisions. So I don't, I don't think you can ever go too far back. I don't think you can ever, you know, like I mean, they told I was in right on the cusp of the generation where we were doing the maths. You know, I was doing my maths GCSEs, and I know it's further than that. And um, they were like, I'm not going to have a calculator in my pocket. So like, hmm. I've got one on my wrist, I've got one in my pocket, I've got one in my bag, two in my bag. You know, it's, it's, there is, so um, teachers don't always get it right. But um, uh, that would be. I'm, I'm really good being my turn and focus with these, you probably realise that. So you, had, you showed us a ten, 10 things, that 10 minutes and 10 seconds. 
10 minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Yeah, ten so probably about eight now. Oh, okay, cool. So to add to, to Dan's question, what do you teach? I think absolutely what has been said here already. So it's the, you know, it's the basics, the first principles. So for me, for me, it's, it's again, it's user needs rather than wants. You know, it's trying to work out when somebody says something, what are they actually after? You know, what should we give them? So that understanding, which I think it can be very hard to get rid of by AI, and I think that's impossible. For, for people like programmers, you know, an understanding of how languages are, software languages are constructed, what are the common principles, I mean, I think, you know, computer science or computing is a good foundation for that. But I think the difference between successful people, candidates, students, and those that aren't, is a curiosity. And I, I, I'll speak to, I don't know about the, the specific skills that John has, but I think for Theo and Ethan, it's wanting to go out and find the next thing. You know, what's the next thing? Because I'm reading the right journals, I'm in the right groups, I understand what's coming down the pipe. You know, getting out and doing, you know, talking to people if you can, but also being willing to pick up the next thing and go with it and try it, um, and wanting to have a go. So, the, so the software I'm doing right now, it's it's um, content management system stuff. It's called Drupal, big community, eight thousand programmers in the UK, and I think I characterise them all. By, they all want to have a go at the next thing. They all want to collaborate on the next thing. And that's the stuff that sets them apart. And I think it will be the stuff that keeps them meaning, doing useful, meaningful things, being able to pay a mortgage, you know, get on with life. For the, for the students here, I think it's, I was going to wrap up, but I think briefly it's, yes, do your studies, but get involved in something else. You know, what do you want to build? Um, the, I think we, we did a, a tech we did something called Tech Match, it was like an A-level student project, A-level computing project, where students were encouraged to go out and build a piece of software, and they all built squash ladders. There were too many squash ladders we built. So we said actually to them, why don't you think of something you would like to build? Why don't you find a real example of something you want to build that you actually would enjoy? So you won't always get that in your career. Find something you'd like to build and have a go at that. And don't, don't do it on your own. Try and involve other people in the disciplines. If you've got a good design friend, try and involve them. If you've got people who are good at numbers, project management, try and involve them and do it as a team, which is what Theo and we were able to do, ultimately. So find something you want to do and have a go. And that will bring you into contact with professional, other professionals, other people in that space. And if you're doing that in your career, you'll always be learning. You'll always, I think you'll future-proof yourself. If you're active, if you put, put time in. I have a, a tiny bite on your original question. I think um, exactly as you said, like a, a, a traditional software education is still absolutely important. Um, this is, is probably way too much detail. De these large language models are statistical, right? there's some like inherent randomness in what they do. And I seriously hope we're a long way away from trusting a large language model to like run our banking system. You know, I would like to send this person fifty pounds and suddenly the language model decides to do something completely random. So, so like traditional software isn't going away. Like, these models change some things but definitely not everything. <laughs> I'm going to take a service as I approach this. I'm going to say the first thing you need to do is create a way for everybody to access the service. Right? And so um, I think that there is, uh, my, so I'm, without looking at some data, it's not hard to do, but my assumption 
that I'd want to test immediately is um, what's the digital literacy, what's the um, uh, uh, sort of penetration of digital devices and things that everybody has got. I think there's some brilliant uh, learning tools out there that you can get access to that are pretty cheap, but it's like 300 pounds a year for access to Code Academy, which is a brilliant online tool for learning how to use all of these programs. Um, I think we need to create a destination for people that, uh, to bring business in. Um, so business opportunities is, is, is what we're, of course, I think, um, uh, finding a way to bring in talent um, with experience so that other people who don't have experience have, you know, kind of this. It's probably not far off what I'd be, what I'd be doing. Um, I think that we need to um, get slightly political, but I, I, I don't think over the last 12 years we've, we've seen a, a lot of investment uh, in education. Um, and even though I, I don't think that the traditional go and get a degree group is necessarily the only route into this, I do still think there's a lot of merit in that. I, did, I haven't, didn't have things figured out, and I just kind of did a degree in what I enjoyed, enjoyed doing. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm mean, short of using it. Uh, the other way that you could do it, you could, uh, could do is with 50 million pounds, that's a reasonable amount of money, um, is potentially offer um, some tech forward companies uh, some incentives to come and base themselves in the school. Um, I, I think that's the other way that you can tackle this, I think. But I think it's making sure that everybody can access it, making sure that there are um, some official routes into it, I think, because some people just need to be able to follow something um, and then make it attractive for uh, employers that want to base themselves in school. That would be how I would do it. <laughs> I don't have a clue. I don't have a clue. That's my answer. <laughs> Very we don't have to spend it all in one hit, you know. What hit do you need to do? Let's start. I take the money and disappear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Very briefly, yeah, you don't need to spend 50 million on, maybe take three or four million aside. And to the lady who talks about careers, careers officers, how do you find out about this stuff at all? I think I'd start there. So, what support they're getting, they're under a lot of pressure. And to, and to the students who are coming into this, what do you actually want to hear about? I mean, I do career sessions in schools, and a lot of the talk I did today is quite as part of that. So, start there, grow interest around, like, you know, that's the service, isn't it? We're starting to go into Gross, gross service and awareness. And as these kids start getting, students, students young people start getting more into it, what are we, what's the provision then? So where are they going, like next to East Sussex College? How we, let's put some money into that provision. And then I think incentives for tech companies to come and employ. So what about space? There isn't a lot. What about, a, a lot of go-ahead cities in the States run grant programs for companies to relocate. What are we doing about that? So maybe put 10 million into that. I'll take another 10 million and set up an incubator. Yeah, there you go. I mean, you know, that's that, but, but it doesn't need 50 million because I think as it starts to roll, it starts to fund itself. So if you want to talk about that another time, you could. Yeah, I think we're. Yeah, yeah. yeah.